Welcome to Unit 7, which I like to call Math of Chemistry, though your teacher may call it Stoichiometry. Depending on how deep you go into this unit, um, it could get really complex. Many high school students just take this a few steps in and it can still be tough. My goal here is to make this as easy for you as possible, but it is important to recognize that you may not need all of the information that I'm going to teach in this unit. So make sure to check with your teacher uh, to find out exactly how much of this unit you need to know. The very first lesson is on moles and formula mass. And the question of the day is how do chemists measure things that they can't see? Atoms and molecules you know are too small to be handled individually, so how on earth do chemists actually do this? A mole is a bundle of atoms. Scientists have determined that we're gonna collect atoms into bundles. We call those bundles moles. When you have a bundle of atoms, they're a lot easier to handle. In fact, it's the only way we can handle atoms is by grouping them together in to make, to make uh, bigger blobs of atoms. We make substances, really. And we've decided on the size of a mole by using carbon as our reference. So the number of atoms that are present in exactly 12 grams of carbon-12 is the quantity that is a mole. Now, you may think of mole and think of this cute little guy, or like a freckle. We're talking moles like chemistry moles. So anytime you have to Google something, you have to make sure to Google a chemistry mole. Um, it's also a shortened version of molecule. That's where the word came from. So getting back to that initial question, how do chemists measure things that they can't see? Well, they bundle or lump those atoms into groups that we can see, and we call those groups moles. So a way I like to think about it is sandcastles. If you've ever built a sandcastle before, you know that you take large bundles of grains of sand and lump them together into a bucket or a sandcastle mold. I'm gonna use bucket from here on out. This way it doesn't sound like mold. <laughs> Um, but if you have a sandcastle, you're going to fill this bucket full of sand, and then you're going to flip it upside down, lift the bucket up, and then you have all of your grains of sand put together. It would be really ridiculous to try to build a sandcastle by stitching together individual grains of sand. It would take you forever, and in a lot of cases, it would be near impossible because you go to touch one grain of sand and a bunch of others are going to get stuck to your fingers. So this is kind of the same concept with scientists, except the grains of sand are way tinier and you literally cannot pick them up. There's no tweezer tiny enough to just grab one atom. Um, so we take our atoms, which we can't see at all because they're even tinier than grains of sand, and we lump them together. So a grain of sand would be like an atom, and the bucket that we use would be the mole. We use that to kind of lump them all together. And in this case, you can count how many um, buckets are overturned to figure out like the size of your sandcastle. We kind of do the same thing with atoms. We use these bundles called moles to figure out exactly how many atoms we're working with. So what exactly is a mole? Well, the number is really big. It's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That's how many carbon atoms there are in 12 grams of carbon-12. That is 602 sextillion. So you move the decimal two times to get behind the two, and then you add 21 zeros, and then you'd have the full number 602 times 10 to the 23rd. We call that Avogadro's number. It's named after the guy who originally came up with this idea. He didn't quite have the number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, but he had the concept. A bunch of physicists figured out the number and then credited that number to the man Avogadro. Um, so each element we know has its own mass. If you look at the periodic table, you know that hydrogen has a mass of one, helium is four, carbon is 12, silicon is 28, blah, blah, blah. Each of these masses represents one mole of that element. So up until this point, we've been looking at the periodic table and the masses as atomic mass units. Now we're gonna look at them as grams. That's the cool thing about moles is that when you have just the right number, um, you don't have to do a unit conversion between atomic mass units and grams because that crazy number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd kind of did that for us. So we just read these as if they have different units. We read them as grams instead. So we know that each element has its own mass, and we're looking at one mole of each of these elements when we are talking about um, their masses and how much they are. So all of the moles are going to have the same quantity. 
if you have a mole of donuts, a mole of golf balls, a mole of carbon atoms, you're going to have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of these things. It's kind of like the word dozen. A dozen just means 12 of something. A mole just means 602 sextillion of those things. So because all moles have the same quantity, we can use moles in place of um, molecules when we talk about chemical reactions. In a chemical reaction, you would say that three moles of ammonia breaks into, no, two moles of ammonia breaks into uh, one mole of nitrogen and three moles of hydrogen. We can use mole or molecule. Either way, they're interchangeable. So the mole of ammonia would have a different mass from a mole of nitrogen or from a mole of hydrogen because they're made of elements that have different masses. Um, I like to think of it as a mole of elephants and a mole of butterflies, <laughs> two different animals. A mole of elephants is going to be gigantic, probably like larger than planet Earth. Um, and then a mole of butterflies is definitely smaller, but it's going to be less massive. Um, like volume wise, it's smaller, but mass wise, it's going to be smaller as well, because a single butterfly is smaller than a single elephant, if that makes sense. So if you had a mole of hydrogen and a mole of... I don't know, 10, a mole of hydrogen is going to be much lighter than a mole of 10, simply because hydrogen is lighter than 10. If you have 12 hydrogens and 12 tins, the 12 hydrogens are still going to be lighter. All we're doing is replacing dozen with this giant number, the mole. And the reason the number for a mole is so large is because atoms are so tiny. You have to get a lot of them bundled together before they're really like tangible. So the only way that we know that we have a mole of a substance is to find out its mass because we can't count these individual atoms. So instead, we are going to use the periodic table to add together all of the masses, convert them to grams just by pulling them from the periodic table and totaling them up. So previously, we would look at this as one molecule, not quite, but one unit molecule of potassium permanganate. In this, we have one potassium, one manganese, and four oxygens. Well, if I had a mole of these, then I would have a mole of potassium and a mole of manganese and four moles of oxygen. See where I'm getting at here? So previously, we would look at this as single atoms, and we would look at the whole thing as a molecule. Now we're going to take a bunch of these potassium permanganates and lump them together so that we can actually physically work with them. You and I cannot work with a single potassium permanganate. It's too tiny. So we take a bunch of them, lump them together, and make a mole of potassium permanganates. We can't possibly sit here and count them all out. There's not even enough seconds in your lifetime to count to a mole because it's such a large number. So instead, what we're gonna do is count by weighing. We're gonna find the mass of this on a scale. and because every element has its own mass, you can't just like pile stuff onto a scale until the scale tells you you have one mole of stuff. You'd have to tell the scale what you were measuring. So the first thing that we're going to do for this is count up all of the atoms that we have in the molecule, or really the number of moles we have in a mole of this molecule. So we have one potassium, one manganese, and four oxygens per one mole of potassium per manganese. We're going to look up the masses on the periodic table, and because we are talking about a mole of this substance, meaning a large bundle of these atoms, um, well, not even a large amount, we're looking at a specific number of these atoms. We are going to pull those masses, and because we're talking about moles, they're going to be in grams instead of atomic mass units. So here I'm just working in whole numbers for the sake of um, ease here. Uh, this entire unit, I don't focus on significant figures. I think that's one extra thing that we just don't need. Your teacher may care about significant figures, so make sure that you are minding your significant figures rules if that is the case. But per, uh, potassium is actually 39.10, manganese is 54.94, round that to 55, and then oxygen comes in at a solid 16. It's 16.00. So what I like to do is this QMT chart, the quantity mass in total. This is going to help us throughout the unit as we move through 
um, this concept of moles and taking tiny little intangible atoms and bulking them up to a place where humans can actually work with them. So we are going to multiply going across. So this 39 is one times the 39, giving me the total mass of all of my potassiums. Same thing happens here for the manganese. And then lastly, I have four oxygens coming in at 16 grams apiece, giving me 64 grams in total of oxygen per mole of the potassium per manganate. When I add that all up, this is going to tell me the mass of one mole of potassium per manganate. So if I'm in a lab and I needed for my chemical reaction, let's say, one mole, right, my chemical reaction is maybe going to say potassium permanganate decomposes into its elements. So I would have a one here, and then this would decompose into one potassium, one permanganate, and two diatomic oxygens, giving me four in total, the big two times the little two. Um, I would know that I had one mole of it when I had 158 grams of it. That's how you count them. That's how you know that you have one bundle of potassium permanganates. So in this case, the scale or the balance is going to tell you you have 158 grams, and that's when you know that you had a mole of it. Now, if you doubled the 158, then you would have two moles of potassium permanganate. If you cut it in half, you would have half a mole of potassium permanganate. I mean, even think about buying donuts or bagels. If you go to the bakery and ask for a half dozen donuts, you're going to get six donuts. You can cut these numbers in half. That's fine. You can get two dozen donuts. That would be 24. We're kind of doing the same thing here, um, but in this case, we're just working with one for now. When we have 158 grams of potassium per manganate, that's when I know that I have 602 sextillion potassium per manganate molecules. So let's say for a chemical reaction, I needed one mole of calcium hydroxide. Well, how would I know when I had a mole? The only way to know is to get its mass. So I'm going to find the mass of this entire calcium hydroxide and figure out when I need to stop shoveling calcium hydroxide onto my balance. So the process here is to list all of your elements just like this. And then I, like I said, like to do the QMT, which stands for quantity, mass, and total. QMT. And I know for some of you, this will be pretty tedious, but when we get into percent by mass, um, this total column is going to help you quite a bit. So I definitely recommend that you stick with this QMT chart, at least for a little bit. So quantity just means that we're counting um, how many we have. So we have one calcium. And then remember this little two outside the parentheses is going to distribute in, telling me I have two oxygens and two hydrogens. The mass I'm going to pull from the periodic table. And throughout this unit, you will get really good at remembering all of the masses. I know that calcium is 40, oxygen is 16, and hydrogen is 1. When you multiply these counted quantity measurements, really, um, they have an infinite number of zeros behind them, meaning that it has way more significant figures than the mass does. So when you multiply, you're going to stick to the number of significant figures on the mass. I remember you multiply going across. So this is going to come out to 40, and you should match your significant figures on the total to the mass. 2 times 16 is 32. If you didn't know your 16 times tables, I promise by the end of your stoichiometry unit, you'll know them. And then 2 times 1 is 2. So this tells me that I have 40 grams of calcium, 32 grams of oxygen, and 2 grams of hydrogen per mole of calcium hydroxide. So I'm going to add this all going down, and that is going to give us, um, let's see, four and seven, 74 grams per mole. I have 74 grams every time I have a mole of calcium hydroxide. If I wanted two moles, then I would double that 74. If I wanted half a mole, I would divide that 74 in half. All right, here is another example. Here we have aluminum carbonate. And the question is how many grams per mole or what is the formula mass of an aluminum carbonate? So we are going to list all of the elements, aluminum, carbon, and oxygen, and then we're going to fill out that QMT chart. I have two aluminums, three carbons, and nine oxygens. Mass of an aluminum is 27. Carbon is 12. 
and oxygen is 16. 2 times 27 is 54. 3 times 12 is 36. And 9 times 16, I don't remember. 144. We're going to add all of these going down the total column. And that comes out to 234 grams per mole. Come on. And there you have it. That's how you figure out the formula mass. Again, the more you work with moles, the more it kind of makes sense. Um, it's really just a practice thing. The formula mass, once you learn the process, is very simple, but the mole concept itself is really tough to wrap your brain around. It's important to remember that atoms and molecules, we often call them particles, are super, super, super small. And at this point, we don't have the technology to work with individual atoms and molecules. So instead, we lump them into groups that we call moles. All of those mol moles are of equivalent quantity, meaning that if you have a mole of carbon, a mole of gold, a mole of aluminum carbonate, you will have the same number of particles. This helps us to work in ratios. So it's almost kind of like um, doubling a recipe, right? If you wanted to make a cake, you would use a certain number of ingredients. If you wanted to make a mole of cakes, you would need a mole of each ingredient. Um, if you wanted to make two cakes, you would have to double your recipe. If you wanted four cakes, you'd have to quadruple your recipe. If you want a mole of cakes, you would have to multiply all of your ingredients by a mole. That's kind of what we're working with here. A mole is just a name for a very large number, and that number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, 602 sextillion, and that is called Avogadro's number. We'll talk about him more when we get to gases, because that is where the concept of a mole came from, um, but his number is not something that he came up with. He just came up with the concept of bundling atoms into groups of equal size. And that's it. That is everything. Please leave any questions you have in the comment section below the video. I'd be happy to get them answered for you. Subscribe so you don't miss the next lesson where we really get into this QMT chart. I hope to see you there. Bye.